Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Aisha Razanfer and I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Sheffield. Currently, I'm also a lecturer at Darul Hikmah University, Saudi Arabia. I flew all the way over here to uh, present this talk regarding my study that's ongoing at the moment. Um, if we start with the environment, we want to see what exactly does the environment do to ourselves in terms of our brain and in terms of our behavior. My main subject here is the autistic child. I've been working within this field, within this uh, population group for a long time. My interest is basically based on how they are different and why are they different in terms of uh, their brain based and in terms of the behavior as well. So the whole idea is to encompass the whole thing within this study and to see what we can see in terms of a change within the child when they go through different environments A, B and C. So while keeping the subject as constant, but the environment as variable. I'll be uh, giving you more detail about this as I uh, move through my slides. Uh, sorry, I was just changing here and I forgot to change here. Okay, uh, there's a very famous quote by John P. Eberhard, which really interested me when I actually started working and kind of uh, getting into more neuroscience. In neuroscience, we believe that the brain is the organ that controls behavior, that genes control the blueprint, but the environment can modulate the function of the genes and ultimately the structure of the brain. Changes in the environment changes the brain and therefore they change our behavior. Architectural design changes our brain and our behavior. Again, there's a very famous quote by Edward T. Hall that man's relationship to his environment is a function of his sensory apparatus plus and how this is conditioned to respond. If you look at this one, like we know that autism itself is uh, neurological variance and genetic makeup as well. But at the same time, we, we need to see and we need to believe in that it's not just that, that nothing can happen. But when these genes and these uh, background of the neurology when it interacts with the environment, we can see changes. And how can we do that? What do we need to do? What do we need to learn? And how can we encompass all that information within the study? Okay, so basically what is autism? Autism is not a disease but a genetic and neurological variance which makes it difficult for autistic individuals to perceive sensory data the way neurotypical people do. We all know that brain is changing, it's evolving all the time. And as with the new research, brain is plastic, it's no more static. And it's developing at a very uh, fast paced rate when we are younger, but at the same time it keeps developing when we are adults and become old as well. But again, the, we do see a difference in the brains of autistic children. And what's that difference? The, the brain grows at a very strong rate between the ages of six months to 12 months. And it's, the neural growth is multiplying at a very high rate. And we do see that the brain itself is different. It's bigger than the normal or neurotypical child. So seeing that difference, as they move within the age of, between the age of two and four, the neural growth starts slowing down. And we see that that's why all the research that says early intervention programs, which are between the age group and two to four, can really helpful for these kids because at this stage, the patterns are not settled. It, it's easy, uh, to, to overcome the problems, but again, not that everything can be fixed, but again, yes, to an extent, it's, where it's easy at this stage to induce, to intervene, to overcome the problems that are faced by the autistic child. What's the prevalence of autism right now? I'm gonna go over very quickly on some stats. It's 1% in Asia at the moment, and one in 88, according to the Disease Control Center in US, and in Pakistan, where this study is being currently conducted, it's 350,000 children, and it's growing very strongly at a rate, but again, the basis of why and this is happening is still not very evident. Uh, this study has taken place within Pakistan, it's still we are conducting the study, and the school has been identified, the children have been identified, and it's a longitudinal study, which is like a year long, in order to get the results that we are expecting. Again, we all know that the children who are on the autistic spectrum disorder are very different from the neurotypical people, uh, neurotypical children, and how are they different? As 
it's, um, uh, we know that, you know, the different brain development. Can you all hear me or it's just gone slow? Okay. We all know that the brain uh, can, should we, de sh uh, should we design the classroom for the brain development age or should we just design it for like the whole group of uh, children rather knowing what's the background? So we need to see how can we balance it. We need to know about the population group. We need to know about the user group. What's the differences that they are facing? What are the neurological basis of the problems that are there that are existent? So again, within this study, the study, the subject is basically from the early intervention program where they start presenting these problems and in order to tackle them at a very, very early age and to see how do they change when they move from one environment to the other. The detail of the experiment, I will be moving in detail as I move forward. Again, this is a, a kind of a, a sketch showing the different parts of the brain where we see that the neurological underpinning of how the brain is different and why is it different in that area and how does it affect those sensory problems that are faced by the autistic child. Whether it's auditory integration problem, uh, whether it's uh, a visual, whether it's tactile, but again, if we look at the main, uh, the root cause, rather than saying that the sample is very heterogeneous, all the children are different, and we all know that one child is different from the other. But again, if we see the neurological underpinning where it is different and how it is different, and how can we tackle that root cause? But again, we know that the sample is different. Some kids are high functioning, some kids are low functioning, some are hyper, some are hypo but again if we know the neurological underpinning and we design for that we will have everybody on the spectrum on the board but it will affect someone some of the kids more but some of them less but again they will be affected and that would be the results that would be achieved from this study again uh, with the literature uh, about the neuroscience and architecture there's a very uh, uh, important piece of research done by dr gravens regarding the uh, auditory and visual processes of the uh, new, uh, neonatal babies in an nicu at that time when they are preemies and how and what sort of uh, impact the environment can have on them when they're functions are not still developed their brain is still developing to take all that information in we don't see that and we just design for the staff and for the people and we have loud huge announcement the acoustics does not respond to the baby that's been there so these small things in the environment actually interfere with the functioning of the brain and if we take care of all those things at that particular point we will not be able to see uh, these babies being born with some sort of a deficit or problem that can become a long-term basis for that now again, we, there's another very important study. We do see, uh, there are a lot of literature on autism and architecture, but again, we do lack a lot of empirical findings that is the major thing that can inform how and what impact of the design can have. One very important piece of research done by Dr. Magada Mustafa in 2008 was regarding the autism and architecture. She presented her findings about how environment can affect them in terms of spatial competencies and um, in terms of auditory input that they get from the environment. So she tested both of them, one in the classroom for the spatial competencies and one for the auditory in terms of the speech, uh, speech therapy room. What happened again when we review this research is basically we see that there was, a, a, there was a, the sampling procedure that did not collect the individual baseline data of the, the child itself. It was a cross-sectional study. So if we don't consider the individual competencies or the individual uh, problems that's being faced by the child, even within that group, this means we are ignoring and we're not trying to see the heterogeneity or the actual difference between from child to child. Again, we will cover this within this study. How do we move within the study forward with the group that we have selected? Again, the study was being conducted based on one control group and one study group. The thing is, if the, the child is different and you are comparing them with another group, which is the control group, and then you have a study group, and you are having the intervention within the study group, but you don't do anything to the uh, control group, what happens is we know that every autistic child is different, and they are on the different level of that spectrum. But having them 
compared to another group which is totally different, it makes more sense when they are being compared with their own relative progress over a, over a longer period of time to see the development, rather than being comparing them with, with another group of children, though it's placebo, but again, I think so we need to see them in a longitudinal phase to see com being comparing them within their own competencies, how they have developed, because they are all different. So we, we need to compare them with their own background of stage one, stage two, and st stage three. The acoustic variable was being tested, but it was within the speech therapy room, which already needs to be uh, uh, done in a way that speech or the hearing or the language or whatever is a part of that particular room need, need to be um, accommodated, which was not a part of the learning environment. Auditory integration acoustics are a major component of a learning environment where they can make a huge difference of how these children learn to uh, to learn and understand the language and also acquire the language as well. Again, uh, what is a salutogenic model? This study is based on the salutogenic model of how do we cope or how these children cope with stress, how does this affect their health and how do they cope it all together. We know that, as um, uh, Dr. Beeb just said, that mirror neurons are a major thing and it helps in the acquisition of language. Mirror neurons are affected within autistic children and which gives a basis for them being having delays on the language and relying more on the auditory input, which becomes a very important variable within the learning environment where they are being taught because the reliance is more on the auditory input that's, that's being uh, taught to them. Again. The methodology as well counts within the learning environment, how are they being taught and which is the methodology that's being used there. So, so if we look at the salutogenic model, if everything is falls in place, what we are trying to achieve, brain plasticity, improved overall physical health, improved long-term memory and learning, improved cognitive skills. The other approach to this one is having a multidisciplinary approach to all the information that's coming in, that's pouring in, because one discipline is reliant on the other one. Though we have the neuroscience that's telling us what's the problem with the brain. There's a problem with the auditory input, there's a problem with the mirror neuron, there's a problem with the sensory dysfunction, but again, what other things are happening when new fields are being involved? For example, it's education. If it's education, they are learning. What's the methodology that's being taught? Is it teach? Is it LOAS method? If it's a teach method, what is it relying on? Is it relying on the visual? Is it relying on more on auditory? So that once you are looking at the environment, you know how to cater to those things that are there. So all these are being taken care of, and we are looking at that in this whole study. So it's not just about uh, picking up one and relying on that. It's a multidisciplinary um, relationship that one affects the other. Again, in psychology, we see the behavior. In education, we see the methodology of the teach. We, in the neuroscience, what's the background? That's the underpinning of that problem. In architecture, how the physical environment is adding to this input. So it all works together to come up with a more holistic understanding and a holistic outcome of what and how it should be. Again, I'm gonna talk about the study. What exactly are we doing? It's uh, the incident, in, incident rate in Pakistan at the moment is 350,000 kids. It's increasing, but again, this, these figures are not definite because um, in Pakistan, there's not much awareness about this uh, problem. But again, to the data that's been presented at the moment, there are more than 350,000 kids. The school that has been selected for this is the Oasis School for Autism, which is the first ever school in Pakistan that's been designed to, the, to take care of these kids in terms of um, the problem that they face. The, pr the methodology that they're using is the teach. And again, the unique learning process for each individual child has been um, understood. Early intervention program is the main target. And then the testing of the different variables within the environment. Again, the methodology is longitudinal study, nine to 12 months to take, up to take readings of the data, keeping the subject constant and the environment variable. The ASD child moved from, moved from, uh, moves into three different environments to see how the environment can be attributed to the changes that are happening in terms of the behavior. 
subject selection process for the study is basically based on the early intervention uh, program and the prospective students that would be starting this school first they are being assessed in their environment before starting the school then starting the school and then the intervention uh, phase when they are within that classroom with the intervention and how these three different environments add to that information prioritization of environmental variable how and why did we decide on the variable that has been selected study of subject within the three exper experimental environments prioritization of environmental variable is basically again uh, in the learning environment there's a a growing amount of research suggesting that acoustics needs to be appropriate for or be conducive to learning. And again, if we look at the autistic child who's already facing the auditory integration problems, when we pair them both together, what and how can we achieve the results that, that can be the most beneficial within the learning environment and also looking at the symptoms that are there. For example, in autism, is paired with the learning environment variable, which is the acoustics, Autism, auditory, learning environment is acoustics. In acoustics, how can it help? We know that language, learning, and hearing are all connected. There's improved learning, a stimulation of speech, language acquisition, and speech intelli intelligibility happens if we have the proper auditory input, and then we can have more speech int intelligibility, language acquisition, and uh, stimulation of speech. Now the experimental environments, what are the environment A, B, and C? Environment A, study of the assessment environment for the sample group before starting formal school for autistic children. Study of the environment for the sample group after starting OASIS school for autism. Environment C, study of the environment for the sample group within the altered environment after introducing intervention variable. Again, what are we looking at in terms of the markers? Uh, cognitive markers, then we have behavior markers, we have educational markers, we have neurological markers, and we have physiological markers. We will be looking at all these markers in order to come up with a more holistic outcome to know and to have an understanding and how the environment should be tailored and what should be the final outcome. Limitations were small sample size and time. Again, expected results and future implications. The research identifies environmental stimuli, which represents the different types of stresses that inhibit learning or affect cognitive functioning in children diagnosed with autism. What we should be doing is, once we've tested one variable and come up with a holistic outcome and information, we should be testing the other variables in the environment for these children pa being parallel with the symptom and the environment to have a proper guideline for the architects and for the designers that can be utilized for the uh, purposes of design. And again, that's about it. Thank you so much. <laughs>